Here's the thing I'm going to forget to tell you, so I'll tell it to you now while only the early birds are here while I'm thinking of it. Um, you can set the screen size of tables. So if the one size fits all size that you're all used to is not what you really want. Um, like in this example, you can do something else. So in this case, my table is too fat and it's not tall enough. So if I do that one, then I have a, ooh, maybe that's too tall for my screen. Anyway, um, oh yeah, not good. <laughs> Alright, let's make it 400 pixels tall and 100 pixels wide. No, looks like I have 300 pixels. Alright, there it is. Okay. Uh, my reason for doing that was because the more, the, the, the bigger you make something vertically, the more accurately you can control it with a mouse, assuming you're controlling only down to the pixel, which is the way tables work. Um, actually, they, they maintain floating point values, which are to high precision, but when you're editing them, you can only push them onto a pixel value, which might or might not be available, but it's more likely to be available the bigger you make the thing. So that's a, that's a trick. This is just a review from last time. Um, Right now what we're doing is we're looking at the first seven values of this table. So it goes up to here. And the, re the reason I know that we're doing that is because I'm taking this phaser, which goes from 0 to 1 in value and multiplying it by 7, which means now you're going from 0 to 7. And then values from 0 to 7 truncate down to values from 0 to 6 when you, when you truncate them to the lowest, well, the greatest integer below them. And as a result, you're looking at the first seven values of the table, which are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the others are there, just there in case you want them later. You don't have to have them. In fact, I could resize the table to seven values now, but I might decide that I want a different size sequence later. And I can do that just by changing the number. And now we're looking at 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9 out of the 12 values. Notice that it gets faster as I ask it to use more values. That's just because the frequency that I'm giving the phaser is, is setting the period for the entire sequence. And the more notes I stuff in there, the faster the notes are going to be going. Or to put it another way, the more you multiply the phaser by, the faster the, the output is changing in time because the, big, because the more it travels all told. That is the, that is the frequency in a hertz of this phaser. Uh, it, let's see, it does 0.7 of that sequence every second. In other, so if I, if I set this to one, it's one cycle per second. If I set it to two, it's two cycles per second. So here's one. If I say two, it'll go twice as fast. Oh, so right now it's every second, right? Two is not every two seconds, but every half second. So 0 0.7, what's that? That's 1 over 0 0.7 seconds in period, which is 1.3 something. And I don't know why I chose that value. Actually, I know why I chose that value. I, I tried 0 0.5 and it was too slow for my taste. Right. Okay. Um, so the... Um, the purpose, of, uh, does everyone understand how this example works? Or can you formulate questions if you don't? Yeah. Right, okay, so the multiplier is, is taking the phaser's output and rescaling it so that it goes from zero to seven in this case. And the adder, I'm not using at this point, I'm adding zero, which isn't doing anything, but if I wanted to, Instead of looking at the first seven points, look at the points two through eight or three through nine. I would add something to the scaled value, and that would be reading a different place on the table. It, it, yeah, it's a, oh boy, it's sort of a phase shift, but it's also it's just a shift shift, you know. Right. Yeah. This is a this is uh, worthy of. of 
what's the right word? This is worthy of just mastering in its own right. This is this is the general formula for I want a range and it's, I want it to be seven wide and I want it to start at zero. In general, if you have something that goes, that goes from zero to one and you want it to go from A to B, you multiply by B minus A, which is the size of the range, and then you add A to slide it over to where you want it to go. And you do this all the time in computer music. You do the opposite as well, which is you have something that's going from A to B, where A and B are numbers, and you want it to go from zero to one, because you then want to give it another range, say. So to do that, you would subtract A to make it start at zero, and then it goes from zero to B minus A, and then you would divide by B minus A so that it goes from zero to one. Yeah? So if you start in three, is it going to be It'll. Neither. If I give it three, instead of going zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, it will go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <coughs> sure, I did. I got twelve numbers in here. Oh, if I didn't, then it. Okay, then then it's up to the object tab read to figure out what to do when when I give it a number that's out of bounds, and what it does is it simply clips it. That's to say, it simply limits it to the. It doesn't wrap around. You could you could make it do that. In fact. Uh, if you wanted to make it do that, you would, uh, before this, you would say modulo 12, which you all learned about in high school, right? So mod's a good object. Um, yeah, and you would do something somewhat different in signal land, because mod works great for integers, but for floating point, you might want to have something that's defined a little bit differently from mod. So that gets us down to there, and then base, and then it's just the same stuff that you know about from before. The reason I'm bringing this up today is because I want to use this as the starting point because it might be nice to know different ways of getting values in and out of tables, of which there are a half dozen, and I was having trouble figuring out which one to show you, so I just decided to show you all of them, <laughs> at least all of them that I could think of. And because, actually, it's pedagogically valuable to know them. And we're all about pedagogy here. So here goes. Uh, I have a list. Um, the first thing that you might want to know about is a wonderful object called TabWrite. In fact, I told you about this, but I didn't tell you all about how to use it. Um, without a tilde, and then we give it the table name, which I'll just get from here. And this is a thing which takes two uh, numerical values, which I'll start out by using number boxes to, to specify. And here you say which value in the table you want, three say, and here you say what you want it to be. And ta-da, you're moving value three around in the table. So you see this thing is going up and down as I'm doing this. Okay, this would be kind of, what's the right word? Uh, hideous to have to make a pass that did this to every single value of the table because you would need a different tab write object for every number that you wanted to set, which would be ugly. So you want to do it a little bit more smart than that, for which you will need some objects that might generously be referred to as glue. So there's some glue involved in using things like tab write most effectively. Glue. So suppose I wanted the values to be the following, which I'll stick in a message box. Is this what I want to do to you? Okay, I'm not going to use this message box yet. I'm just going to have these values here so that you can see them. Mm. All right. Uh, do I want seven of these things? Yeah, let's have seven of them. So now, I'm, I'm just making multiples of 110 because since I spent a lot of time in music studios, I like things to actually belong to the uh, Western scale. And 110 is an A, so that's these are easy numbers to just sort of fetch out of nowhere that, that uh, happen to have at least some reasonable Western meaning. Okay, and suppose I want to get these values into this table. What would I do? Uh, okay, technique number one. We could use tab write, but of course I don't really want to type all this stuff in. I want to just have it in, in a message box. How would I get that to happen? Well, there are things that you can do. One, one thing is this. Um, message box. 
saying that the first number is going to be 990 is the same thing as setting, putting a zero here and then putting a 990 there. Um, and a shorthand for doing that in PD as well as in, well, in PD anyway, is you can give it a list of values. And what this means to an object like this, what does an object like this mean? An object except for a couple of exceptional objects will take a list of numbers and interpret them to mean put those numbers into inlets. So this is saying set the set the value at slot zero of the table to the to the number 990. So this thing jumps up into there. Ooh, I don't have a good range for these numbers, do I? Let me change my range slightly. So let's make it let's go up to 1500 hertz. All right. And this is okay, except of course now I can't do this anymore. I can just I can just click it. So it might be nice to know how to do this, but do it in a way that has a variable associated with it, so that I can make that not be a thing that's known already. So that's one thing that I want you to just wonder about for a second while I show you something else, which is this. Okay, now I could say here are a bunch of message boxes, and If I had all seven of these that correspond to these numbers and, and, and gave their locations, and if I sent them all in sequence to tab right, then I would set the table to these values. Right? So there's the first one, there's the second one. Oh, I didn't, oh, I didn't connect it. There's the second one, there's the third one. Right? Okay. That's ugly. And of course now you know that if you just wanted to have some way of doing them all, oh, in fact I can bash it to something nonsensical like that. I could just give myself a button that, that um, activated all these message boxes. A message box actually will respond to any message at all, um, so a bang would be perfectly all right, and will output its contents. So now, let's, let's uh, bash it again. If I whack this button, it puts the good dies in the table. Yeah? Yeah. You could do that, and I didn't do that because I was afraid of confusing people, but <laughs> you could do this. I wouldn't regard this as terribly good style, <laughs> but uh, why? Because Oh, because, um, in fact, what this is doing is confusing because I'm sending this message to this message box, which is ignoring it, and that, someone could look at that and wonder what on earth I was doing. So it's a little bit better to do it the way I did it, but you could indeed do it that way. Oh, come on. Let me select this other thing. Yeah. Okay. And this is still a little bit ugly. So let me show you the next thing that's a little bit less ugly. Which is this. I can always say, still using tab right, I can um, say, pass the following messages, please. Okay, I'll keep going. Stop there <laughs> because I'm going to run out of screen. <laughs> Yikes! <coughs> right, and now what this is is four messages in a single box which are delimited or separated, if you prefer, by commas. So commas are special characters in PD. There are three special characters in PD, four special characters in PD, sorry. The comma, the semicolon, dollar signs, and spaces. Spaces you know about because you just use them to separate things. Uh, commas separate things, but in a, in a way that means to a message box, let there be another message now, and it's going to start here with this thing. So this is different from this message box because this contains one message with seven numbers, and this now contains four separate messages, which will all be sent in sequence. And I have to tell you about how long it takes this to happen, but that's perhaps for a little bit later. It doesn't take any time for this to happen, is the short answer. And so this is now a shorthandish way of saying, okay, go ahead and send these four messages that did this thing. Furthermore, you know what order they happen in. And here you don't actually know what order these three things went off in, because it really is just whatever order I connected these things in. Order, the order that things happen in is sometimes very important. 
I've been avoiding getting into situations where the order matters, but I'm going to start making situations like that today because that's part of the loop. Questions about this? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So this is the importance. It's, there are 12 points in it, and why the vertical axis is nothing to 1,500. I made it minus 1, so you could see 0. And there are 12 points in it. And this is the screen size of the table, which I changed also. Other questions about this? No, everybody's totally happy. Let me show you another thing that will save you uh, some typing. If you really just want to put a bunch of numbers in the table, another shorthandish way of doing it is to say, ooh, should I tell you this? Yeah, I'm going to tell you this. Okay. Second, second technique of doing things, the second flavor of glue that exists in PD that you will want to know about. And I'm going to do this, show you to, to this now because it's easy to confuse this with what I'm doing now, and it's different. So right now what I'm doing is I'm sending messages to this object tab right. You can also send objects straight to this, or sorry, send messages straight to this object. And then you're not talking to a particular auxiliary object like tab right or tab read tilde or whatnot. You are talking straight to whatever the table itself thinks that it likes to do with messages. And what it does is designed for uh, is designed for what it is. Um, and how you get a message to it is you say send. So let's get an object, yeah. and the object is going to be send. And then I'm going to give it the name of the table as an argument. And then I can actually send it a message which consists of the following stuff. It has a place in the table that we want to put a value in, and then it has the numbers that I want the table to have. That's right. So this is now, uh, 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 that's on the horizontal axis. Start at point zero, please. And and these numbers, any, any, any number of numbers that you wish, are the numbers that you're going to put into the table. All right. This is a good thing because now there's an easy way just to write numbers into a table. All right. So this, all right, now, sorry, I have to think about something here. I have to, I'm going to have to start saving parts of this patch because it's too big for the screen. Okay, well, maybe this is just what it is for now. Okay, so here's technique number one. Down here is what looks like a far better technique. Oh, I don't need this anymore. That was just to, that was just to, um, to make the example, but here's the thing that actually did it, which has all the information. Now, oh, maybe I'll put this, sorry, I'm just cleaning up. Okay. Um, okay, so send is a thing which will, which will allow you to send a message to any named objects. The only object that you've seen so far that has a name is this array or table. Um, another thing that can have a name is, a, is an object who's only purposes, in fact, to have a name, which is called receive. So, let me give it a different name. Oh, you know what? This belongs in a different patch. I'm going to, I'm going to save this patch. This is going to be two, and then three is going to be send and receive. And, and some other stuff. All right. Let's see. Do we need that? We don't need this. Oh, 
by the way, I'm going to get rid of this because, well, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to develop this as, as I do it. Okay, so first off, send and receive as objects. So, no, I don't want to use the word foo, that's too frequent, so dog. Okay, so here's a message that we're sending to dog. In fact, so that we can see it, I'll use a number box. Uh, hello, control three. And then I'm going to say receive dog. And it gets an outlet. Oh, so send dog only got an inlet and didn't get any outlets. Receive dog gets an outlet and no inlets. And now I have this going on. All right. So now what you've got is I was able to put values in the table by sending to the name of the table, but I can also put values into a receive by sending messages to the receive. And to be a little bit more parallel with what I did, something a little bit more similar to what you saw above was I sent, I'm sending a list of numbers like this, and a number box will take a list of numbers and it will pick off the first number because it can only deal with one. All right. This is all going to require five objects. Yeah. How could, yeah, how could you retrieve all that? Okay, so this is a this is another topic, which, um, yeah, which I which I'll get to in a moment. I'm, I'm afraid to talk about it right now. Um, okay. So send and receive are useful because by now you've probably noticed that your patches are starting to have lots and lots of cords, many of which are short because things are local usually, but occasionally your patch, would, no matter how hard you try to figure out how to lay it out, will have a line like this that's like this. And one way of dealing with that um, is simply to put a send object up here and put a receive object down there, and that way you get the connection and not the awful line going through your patch. Later, you'll find that it's even better than that because you can have patches that have multiple windows in them, and send and receive is a good way to get from one window to some remote, not very directly related window. Yeah? So, uh, send and receive works between different patches. Yeah, so for instance, um, here's a, can I do this? Yeah. Here's a new patch, and here's an object. I'll give it the same name, right? And then I'll cook it up to another number. And now, over here I say send dog. Whoa, come here. By the way, one thing that you can like about Linux is that you can do this. In your computers, you have to click this thing to the front, you won't see this. Most people hate that, though. Ta-da, okay. All right, yeah. It's wireless. Yeah, it's it's a wireless connection, and hence it, and because it's wireless, it even works from window to window. Oh, and this is why I've been giving the tables all these funny names, because the tables will will confuse themselves across patches, just as the sends and receives do. So if you use the same send and receive name in two different patches and have them open, they will t get tangled up in each other's messages. Yeah. You have to work harder to do that. <laughs> and furthermore, the timing semantics will be different if you have two different computers. If you do it in one computer, it's instantaneous, but there will be network delay if you do it across two. The objects you need are net send and net receive instead of just send and receive. Yeah? No. Yeah, right, which, is, which makes it even easier to get confused because your patches could be things you developed in different years, right? And or by different people, right? And they could still be talking to each other and getting you in trouble. Only if the patches are open. Only if the patches are open in the same PD. You can also run several copies of PD, in which case you'll get away with it. But, uh, but at the same time, it will turn out to be a good practice sometime in the future to figure out how to localize your send and receive names so that your patches don't cross-talk automatically. 
that and that will be a thing later on in the quarter. All right. So uh, next thing I want to tell you about is packing and unpacking. This is partly in response to one question, I think, but it's partly also just a thing we need. So the question was, um, how could you actually retrieve all this stuff if you wanted to? Actually, there are two related questions, which is, first off, I know how to send a variable message with one number in it, but I don't know how to send a variable message with more than one number in it, which, for instance, you would want to do if you wanted to change... Oh, let's close this now. I don't want to save this. So now, you know, suppose I want to have a number box that changes this fourth number in the table. Well, we could go back to what we were doing. Let's see, and of course I erased it, but I'll put it back. Tab right. Without a tilde, by, by the way, if, if it's a tilde, it wants to take a signal and it will write the signal sequentially into the table. But without the tilde, it needs two numbers, which are where you write into the table and what you write into the table. Okay, so if I want to change the number at location 3, which is the fourth number here, to some new value like 1,000. I have to type 3 there and I have to type 1,000 there. It would be nice to be able to do this and move it up and down without having to set this or, or whatever. Well, or be able to have this thing be controlled programmatically by something else, for instance, that sort of thing. So, ways of doing that. There, will be, there are two things that you can do. To, to get this to happen. The first is, in the, just using the message box, oh, no, let me tell you the other way first, because you need this first. Um, so one thing that you can do is you can pack and unpack messages that have multiple numbers in them. So the way of putting two things together, uh, let me get rid of this, because we already have it. I'll, I'll, so I'll go back to, pa to patch number two and show you more stuff about that signal processing network a little bit later. But first off, here's the thing. Um, I'll get two numbers and I will pack them into a message Ooh, no. using an object which is called pack. And then, just to show you what's... Ha oh. So just to show you what's happening the easy way, I'll say print. And then you'll see the packed messages. So as a rule in PD, when you throw things into inlets that are not the first inlet, if it's not a tilde object, if it's a control object like pack, you, you put things in the inlets and it changes the object, it advises the object in some sense, changes its internal state. Uh, but output in general, or whatever the thing does, is typically engendered by putting something in the first inlet. So now we get this message out 279. Which, so it has two numbers in it, and it is this message, which is those two numbers packed <coughs> into a single message, which we could call a list. It's a list of numbers. Right? So I can change this all I want and nothing happens, but then as soon as I put another value in here, I get to see another pair of numbers. And now I have, well, that hasn't helped me yet, has it? Oh, here's the thing that might help me. If I want to have a way just to write into location four of the table, one thing I could do is say pack zero four, and then I'll put a number in there, Nothing happened. Oh, because I'm not doing anything with it. Duh. All right, where's my tab right here? To try to avoid confusion, I'll make a different copy of the tab right object. And now I've got a message box. It is being converted into a message which is this value and four. Oh, I should print it so you can, so you can see it. I told you about print, but I didn't tell you that you can actually give it an argument to specify what you print. So 
sometimes you need that. Okay, so now what's happening is I put a 450 in. This becomes the message 450 and 4. I could change the value of 4 by putting a message in that inlet, or I can just leave it and it will just say whatever it is, space 4. <coughs> yeah? Oh, thank you. Zero is there simply to say the initial value of this inlet is zero. But in fact, it's never used because, in fact, I immediately override it by sending it values. But if I didn't put it there, it would just be packing the message which consists of four. <laughs> and then I would just be generating a single number. Now you know how to do something that you didn't know how to do before, unless you've been looking ahead, which is, I've been making these, um, yeah, let's get it open. Okay, so what I'm going to do is save patch number two as patch number four, and I don't know what it's going to be named, maybe tab pitch again again. Uh, okay. There's another, okay. You remember that I was, um, I was making myself a message box to start the thing, and then another one to stop it. Now I can do that much better. This is ugly because this value is not in decibels, <coughs> it's in linear units. And I would love to be able to use db to rms to be able to specify that number in decibels, but db to rms only has a single number that goes in and a single number that goes out. Here's db to rms. It's, let's see, can I get rid of this? No. Okay. I'll have to go back to this later, but for right now, I'll just leave it like that. Okay, so I can always, so recall that db to rms does this, db to rms. You put a number in, and out comes the amplitude that you would need to have that number dB in your signal. This is a perfectly good way of turning things on and off. So 70 dB is about 0 0.03, as I was explaining last time. By the way, if you're going to do this, um, let's see, I'm just going to disconnect this before I do the next thing. Let's make this wide. Perfectly reasonable numbers of decibels, like 160, are very bad numbers of amplitude. So it would be very easy for me, notice I've disconnected this for this very reason. So I'm, 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 I'm sitting here at zero, say, and I say, okay, let's turn it on, and we'll turn it on to 70 or so. Uh, whoops, just 70. If I did that, I might have just destroyed my speakers. So if you're going to do this, take this message box, I suggest you take this message box and fix the upper limit to something reasonable. Oh, let me show you that slower. So the message box, atom boxes also have properties, it has a width, but you can specify a lower and upper value. If those values are both zero, that means the thing is just whatever it is, and you can, you can be positive or negative or anything. But if I give it values that are non-zero, it will interpret that as a range. And that range will be enforced, which is good, because what this means is that I have something that I can mouse at very conveniently. So getting the thing to be zero is that, whereas if I did that to a regular old un unvarnished message box like this, I'll turn it off and it'll do that, which is stupid. Or at least that would be stupid for evaluating <coughs> decibels. Zero is perfectly good for just turn me off, please, right? So it's, it's a convenience to have it so that your message box just, or sorry, so that your number box just goes to zero when you drag it all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And to do that, you set the range of the number box to be the, reason, the values that you believe will be reasonable. And then if you repent later and say, actually, I really want 90 dB, you can always type it in. It won't enforce the range. It will simply, it, it's simply a thing that affects how the mouse operates on it. So this is now a good volume control, except for one little thing. 
and one little thing is that it clicks when you turn it on and off. And that's why I was using these things, these things that had time values, but of course, when you had message boxes with the time values, you have to decide what the thing was in advance. But now that we have the pack object, we can do it all right. We can now say pack 050 Now, what's going into this multiplier is the output of line, which is getting messages which are 0 0.2 space 50, that, those two numbers, and that will turn the, the line on and off in a way that will not click. Oops. All right, so this is the, this is a correct, or at least is a not incorrect way of, of managing games in PD. Uh, you can do even better than this, but this is the first time I've shown you how to do it well enough that you would actually want to do this to someone else who had to use your hash. Questions about how this works? Yeah? Could you explain the, pack, the two numbers in the pack? Oh yeah, so the two numbers in the pack serve to do two things. They initialize the values of the inlets of the pack so that this value is initialized to 0 and this value is initialized to 50. They also serve to tell you how many inlets the pack will have because you won't have to do this anytime soon, I don't think, but someday you might have to have a message that has 6 or 10 values in it and you can tell pack to have more than two things by doing that. If you just say pack by default, it assumes you mean two. But, and if you want something else, you give it numbers. It might, well, numbers which will initialize the inlets, but by the way, will also specify how many inlets you want. And you had a question too? Yeah, is the uh, double box that is taking the absolute PDRMS necessary? Or no. Absolute right. It's just so you can see it. And furthermore, there are um, differences of opinion about whether this is good style. Um, there, so there are people around who will pontificate about proper programming style in Max and PD. More in Max, actually, than PD. PD community is kind of forgiving that way. But some people say you shouldn't do this because someone could walk up to your patch and do this. And this would be an, in a bad state now because if I moused on this thing, it would suddenly jump from 0 0.3 to whatever I just made it here, which, is, which wouldn't agree with it. Right? And that might not be a good thing. Yeah? Inedible? Oh, inedible. Um, <laughs> they, they, I don't think they're edible, but uh, y you can't. No, they're... Oh, wait a second. You s no, you can't really. You could set the range to be from two values that are equal, and then, but then if you touched it, it would jump to that value. So actually, yeah, they're always going to be editable. But one thing that you can do that sometimes helps people, and this is programming style, you can do it or not, is make the thing hang like that so that it's clear that it is only there for the purposes of showing you what the number is and it's not there for you to mouse on. That won't stop you from mousing on it, but at least you can sort of tell that mousing on it's not going to do anything for you. So there are people who's, who argue strongly that you should do this instead of what I just did. And me, I'm agnostic about it. I do it sometimes one way and sometimes the other. Other questions? So that is pack and unpack, which we used for two different purposes. Actually, pack, is, pack seems to get used a lot more than unpack because there are objects which, uh, which you have to send messages to that have more than one number in them, or more than one argument, as you might call it. Uh, and unpack, you use if you want to make your own thing that takes packed messages and, and, un and distributes the numbers in it in, in some way or other. Oh, I haven't shown you unpack, sorry. 
Yep, better do that. Okay, so this is now number four, and the reason I didn't show you unpack is because I forgot to finish number three. So let's go back here. All right, so this is pack, and I was just showing you this, and then it wasn't obvious why this was a good thing except for putting numbers in the table, but the other good thing that you could do with pack was controlling volumes in a good way, or controlling volumes in a way that would operate in DB, which you couldn't do before. Now, unpack is this one. Uh, again, you give it uh, arguments. By, um, by convention, I just use zeros for unpack. And the arguments do nothing but set the number of outlets. And the outlets are going to be the two numbers in the message. Oops. So now it's showing me the numbers that I was previously using print to see. The reason I used print before was because I hadn't told you about unpack, but now that you have unpack, you can now make things. Assuming you know when you're building the patch how many items are going to be in your message, how many numbers are going to be in your message, then you can put an unpack there to show yourself what those things are or, or to distribute them in some way that does something useful. So, yeah, okay, good. So now, having seen that, the next thing to do, yes, is go to, is go to win window number four again, and using send and receive bash a whole, oh, I did that, never mind, we're good. You basically know how to do it all now. Except I want to show you one other good thing, which is that you can use text files to, ma to maintain numbers in tables, and that is a good thing because that's one of the easiest ways of getting PD and other software programs to talk to each other. So to do that, we'll go forward to a little bit. No, let's stay here, actually. So the table here can be sent a message, which we use, which we can do send using the send object. Uh, so we're going to send to tab. Oh, we've got one of those. We have an object called send. Okay, so since we have that object send tab blah blah blah, I'll just reuse that object for all the other messages that I'll be sending this thing. There, there are plenty of things that you can send to the table. This was a thing that got values in just by specifying your numbers. So there are also messages that you can send, which are, I'm introducing two things here. First off is the fact that you can actually have messages that have commands in them. And second, um, the fact what the commands actually are. You can say read some file, and it will look at the first 12 numbers that are in that file and put them in the table. And of course, what I have now is just an error message, file1.txt can't open. Okay. So the other thing that we've got is write. Uh, especially for those of you who have Macintoshes, it's getting hard to make uh, text files in Macintoshes because when you open the text editor, it wants to be rich text for you, which you don't want usually if you're doing stuff with computers. Um, so sometimes you have to just make yourself a nice seed text file. So here's write file one dot text. And now that I've done that, uh, maybe oh, it doesn't. Sh Let's look at all file. Uh, oh, I don't want to do that. Never mind. Uh, sorry, I'm I'm using an operating system, and I now have to remember how you see files in this thing. Which is you go get the little finder who. Uh, here. Ta-da, file1.txt. <laughs> and now we have a text editor. This will work on your Macintosh, too, uh, which has the stuff, or your PC, which has the stuff that was in the table. And since this is a text file, you can now read it. You can read it into MATLAB or Octave or what else? Well, 
you can dump it into HTML or whatever it is that you want to do with it. Okay. Similarly, now now if I want, I can have I can put new values in here. For instance, if I wanted to, I could. I don't know. I'll just do it. Doesn't matter whether they're on different lines or not. Let's see, we had 12 numbers in the table, so I'll just give it 12 numbers. It does the it does the right thing if you have the wrong number of numbers. And now we go back to PD. Where was PD? And say read it. And there's the nice table I just edited. Yeah. Ooh, thanks. Yes. Well, you could, you know, you could um, give it a path, so you could say read dot dot slash blah slash file one dot text. And yeah, but for right now, just make everything be in the same directory. Also, you can uh, you can give PD a search path, so there's all there's directory stuff to worry about. One thing that will uh, one thing that will come up and bite you is that when you make a new patch, it doesn't know what directory it's in, and as a result, it might not be able to read a file that is in a directory because the patch itself, before you save it, doesn't isn't in that directory. It's in no directory at all. So you might have to save your patch to t just to tell PD what directory you want the thing to believe it's in so that you can read files in from that same directory. All right. Okay. So you've seen send, you've seen pack, you've seen mes message boxes, and you've seen files. And this is probably... Uh, enough PD lore for a day, so I should show you some more stuff of relevance to music for a while. Like noise. I haven't been making a whole lot of noise yet. Um, what I want to do to that end is start out with the assignment for next week, uh, showing you what it is. Uh, it's on the web page, but the web page doesn't explain it very well, and so let me explain it better. So let's see, I'm going to save this. So the so the near term plan. Uh, I don't need this file manager, do I? Did not. <coughs> so where did I put P? Oh, wow. Hmm. I lost my terminal window. Okay. I'm running two PDs, so I had it miniaturized somehow, and I didn't know it. Um, what's going on? Oh, and I have this terminal. Oh, I see it. Miniaturized them too. Sorry. I'm getting myself confused here. Okay, now I'm no longer confused, maybe. This is a... Okay, you know how to do this. Um, here's a cool thing. Let's see. Let's shut it up. This is an idea that's uh, attributed to Steve Reich. Am I pronouncing his name right? Uh, Steve Reich, who uh, invented the idea of having two tape loops with sounds on them that had slightly different durations and then playing them both so that in a loop so that you would hear them getting phased differently with time. And then, okay, so he did that in a series of famous pieces in the 60s, the first of which I think was called Come Out, which um, you should probably check out if you haven't checked it out. Um, and then he started writing these uh, things like that for instruments. In particular, there's one called Piano Fade, which consists of two pianists, or orders two pianists to each of each of each to play a 12-note sequence at very slightly different speeds, so that they would phase gradually, um, and you would hear them juxtaposed at, at different at different phases, essentially. 
it's the same kind of phase as, as the phase in, isn't in an oscillator except it's being used differently because it's a phase in a melody. Well, you can do that here. fascinating stuff you can do with this, um, of which I'll show you just a little bit. Um, one thing is, and this idea I believe is due to David Wessel, but I'm not sure I, I heard about it from him. Um, you can make melodies, and this is the extra credit, uh, you can make melodies that have two different timbres as well as as well as a repeating doesn't sound as good on this speaker as it did at home. By the way, um, if I were doing this for real, I would probably work on getting that better, but I'm, I'm doing this only with objects which you've seen so far, and it turned out to be tricky to get it to be perfectly clean until you have some more objects in your arsenal. But what's happening now is there are two different tables of pitches. <laughs> and what you should hear is the same um, See the same uh, sorry, we're the same series of pitches as you heard here, except that every third pitch has a different timbre. Slow it down. Then you just hear the thing is a sequence. You can't actually hear the other point of view on it, which is that you can hear the you can hear every third pitch as a separate stream. That only happens at particular speeds. And this is the effect that Wessel, um, I believe, discovered. So now, if I speed it up, at some point you quit hearing that as the sequence going at this speed, and you start hearing it as two different things, one of which is the sharp timbre and the other which is the sinusoid. Right? The original David Wessel experiment was three pitches and down. It's three blind mice now, right? Hmm. No, it's not. <laughs> it's going up. <laughs> it's do, re, mi. Do, re, mi. Like that. Actually, for some reason in this register, the sinusoid doesn't sound like it's the same octave as the other one, but I guarantee you it is. And then if you speed it up, instead of hearing the thing rising like that, you will hear it going down. Okay. In fact, now you hear two different melodies, which are, what's the right word, catacorner, right? And so now, you know, if, if you're good at math, you can figure out that Choosing each two relatively prime numbers, the number of notes in the melody and the interval at which you change from timbre A to timbre B. And then you can pick out basically permuted versions of melodies that exist within themselves. And then, yeah. What does modulus mean? Well, okay. I actually don't know what the word means in, in, in fully general, but in mathematics land, modulus means the uh, range of a set of numbers that repeats. So if you say 5 is equivalent to 2 modulo 3, in that statement the modulus is 3. So 
so it's, I don't know, a better way to explain it than just by contextifying it like that. Okay. Um, and of course, you can do this with, um, or can you? Oh, my patch isn't working today. <coughs> now, you should be able also to hear that uh, phased, but I seem to have forgotten to connect something in the patch to let you hear that. So here's the, here's the basic homework thing, just do this. And then if you want to make it hard, do that, except that every third note should be a separate timbre as well. And then you'll hear really wonderful stuff. All right. Questions about that? Yeah. Is there another patch behind? Oh, is there another patch behind here? I didn't tell you this. Um, if, you, if you're working on a patch and you run out of room, you can just say PD and either give it a name or not. Usually I give it a name just so I can tell what's what. And up will pop another window, and this window is inside this box. And this is what you do. I've been avoiding doing this because I don't think you should be using patches this complicated that you need this yet. But this is what you do when your patches get too complicated to hold on one screen. You start encapsulating parts of it into sub-patches. And then, when you close the sub-patch, oh, let me put something here. When you close the sub-patch, it's still there in this box, and you can see it again by clicking on it. So if you look at a real piece of music uh, realized using either Max or PD, it will typically have hundreds of windows in it. Because all this easy stuff I've shown you so far fits in a window, but by the time you really want to do something specific and you want it just so, and you want to have you know, voices and so on like that, you're going to have windows on top of windows on top of windows. And this is the way of managing that. Yeah? So the reason your PD do it out there has uh, six different connections on it is because the patch itself um, behind the scenes right there. Right. So right. And the reason the patch is behind the scenes is because it implements the homework. <laughs> in fact, there's, a, there's, a, there's another reason too, which is that I implemented the homework in an exceedingly messy way because I made a lot of mistakes and got confused while I was doing it and then kept changing my mind about what it should do. And so it contains a lot of things besides the homework that I want to go back to later, but I don't want to show you right now. <laughs> yeah? Uh, one more question about the, the read file text uh, that you yeah. did earlier. Is there a limitation on how long the path can be before it gives you an error? <coughs> I think it's limited to 4,000 characters. Should be okay. But message boxes don't like to be more than 80 characters wide so that it will automatically wrap the file name in the message box. But other than that, oh, there is a thing which I should have told you. Uh, if there's a space in the file name, PD will think the space means you have two different file names. So this is a, yeah. So spaces in file names are evil as far as PD and Max are concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have like a patch on here that shows how complicated it is? Uh, oh yeah. Google. <laughs> 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 here's the, here's the patch, this will take a moment to load, but, uh, let me just do, let's go for, uh, This is a piece that I'm working on with a composer. And I'll just talk over this while it struggles to load. But so this, oh, here it is. So um, here are a bunch of control panels, each one of these. This is an effects processor. And it has a frequency shifter with a bunch of parameters. And it has bank of comb filters. And it has uh, more comb stuff, a phaser, noise, generator, flanger, harmonizers. Okay, and then meanwhile there is a sampler bank, and there's a thing called Jack, which is just called Jack because it's a name, and then Eric, this is talking to the sinful uh, synthesizer, which you have upstairs if you want it, 
the phase aligned formant generator, which is a synthesis technique that has a bunch of parameters in it and has a bunch of voices in it. Um, I haven't told you yet that number boxes can have sends and receives built into them, which you need to do if you're going to make something this gnarly. Uh, and how is it implemented? Well, oh, there's markup chains that can drive anything that you want. But anyway, here's the, um, the where did it go? I, this machine will not be able to make sound with this patch, I'm afraid. It makes great sounds, I'll tell you. Uh, we're, oh, DSP, yeah. So here's the actual patch. Here's the sampler. The sampler has a few voices of samples, and then this is a spatializer that uh, sums the first four voices into one, per actually voices, well, never mind, into one place, and then these get spatialized separately and so on. The sampler <coughs> itself looks like this. Okay, so there's a bunch of these guys. Uh, red sample control, there's the control thing. Oh, here's an unpack and pack for you. I use that a lot. Here's a polyphonic voice allocator. Fill one like that. Route. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's all an hour? <laughs> no. <laughs> I did this in a couple of years. <laughs> Inventing all the stuff as I went along. This is hardcore can stuff. Can we hear something? Nope. You, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I dropped the sample rate to about a kilohertz, I'd be able to do it on this processor. But this is an atom processor, and this needs core two or so to, to run. Yeah. So. And, yeah. PD get phone. How do I, oh, right, how do I close this thing? Oh, just control that. Yeah, and then there's other stuff. And are you going to close? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, you can make arbitrarily complicated patches. Uh, now, let's see. Let's keep that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That might happen later this quarter or might happen next quarter. Most likely next quarter, but that depends on how things flow. Yeah, you can make various kinds of stochastic processes in PD, and people do use randomness in computer music all the time. Okay, back to lore with tables and whatnot, okay? No, I really don't want to save the changes I just made. But now I want to find the patch I just had. No, I must have closed it. No one. Where was it? Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. Uh, okay, so now, um, just to try to tie things together a little bit, I'm going to go back to using tables as waveforms and not as pitches. Uh, pitches, oh. Actually, before I do that, let me show you something else that this is on the level of glue. I'm, um, I'm remembering that there's something important that I didn't tell you that's worth knowing. So suppose I wanted to put values in the table, but supposing I didn't want to have to type the values out in cycles per second. Instead, I want to specify a melody in pitch, right? That would be a good thing to be able to do. So for instance, suppose I want to See, what's the easy way to do this going to be? I'm going to, uh, yeah, trying, trying not to introduce too many different objects here. So I'm, uh, I'll go ahead and do it in this way because this is going to be the easy, well, let me show you. Sorry, let me, let me start doing it and then try to explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it because I can't figure out how to verbalize it without just showing you. So first thing we're going to do is just say, OK, we're going to put a value in the table. And the value is going to be uh, some number, and it's going to go into slot 0. And then I'm going to have a number <coughs> box that puts the value in. Uh, yeah. Now I've got this thing going. Okay, So now, now what you can see is this first value in the table is going up and down depending on what I put here. Okay. So, the, so the message now is 617 and 0. 0 is where in the table. 617 is the value. Now you can sort of see why, uh, why tab right 
takes the y value, that's to say the, the value value here, and the x value in the other inlet, it is exactly so that I can do this. And it changes the value of the table instead of maintaining a single value and splashing it across the whole table, which is likely to be a less useful thing to do. There is a way to get it to do the other thing if you want, but I don't want to show that to you just yet, because it's more glue. Okay. And now, of course, if I want to talk to the next value in the table, I just say one here, and then I'm changing this next value. And, oh wait, connect it. Duh. Okay. So this is all clear. And now, yeah. Uh, except that, in fact, it won't do anything. So here, uh, so I'll say put in 550, please, and put it in location zero, and now I'll say put something in location zero. But then I have to bang this or send, or maybe resend the 550. And, yeah, there's a thing I have to tell you which I've been putting off, but now that you've asked, maybe this is the moment. You can, okay, here, uh, I'll do it the wrong way first and then show you why it's wrong and then do it right. So the wrong thing to do is, I have to introduce another object to do it right, that's the thing. So the wrong way that doesn't require introducing an object is 550, it's a message, I can throw the number in there and then I can say, so okay, sure it is. Uh, Oh, that one. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay. So I can do nothing. Right. Okay. Zero. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay. That's good. It's not really quite right because what I haven't done is I haven't actually verified that the six goes in here before the 550 goes in there. If the 550 goes in first, then it writes 550 to whatever this value had been before and then writes the thing in afterward. And that would be wrong. I'll make it clearer this way. Um, this sort of textbook example of how to do something wrong. Let's take a number and square it by just using a multiplier. And now what I'll do is just multiply the number by itself, right? Oops. Like that. Now I'll say 5. And 5 squared is 5. Actually, I don't even know how that happened. But then 6, and then I get 30. Why? Because you, you don't actually see it from the patch, but what really, just from the way I connected it, what it's doing is it's sending the 6 to this, value, to this inlet first and multiplying 6 by whatever is in this inlet, which is 5. And then it's hiding the evidence by putting 6 in there. Right? And now, no matter how many numbers I put in, it's going to do it wrong until I happen to put a number in twice, at which point it'll do it right. All right. This is confusing and bad. All right. To make it good, oh no, I don't do that. you need an object which will actually force the order to be a particular order, which is to say you want to put this value in first before you put that value in. And the object that does that for you this is object number six for today, so I'll apologize, I think. Um, it's trigger, which is, um, it's, it's named trigger just because uh, that's what Max used to, that, that's the word that Max Matthews used to use for doing something. So you can think of this as a distributor in an automobile, if you're the type of person who fools with automobiles. And what it does is it takes the value as a floating point number and outputs it here and then outputs it here as another floating point number. And again, I specify float or bang if I want to convert this to a bang message or other stuff that I don't have to tell you yet. And now I've got something that is guaranteed to do the squaring the right way no matter, no matter how, what order I connected it in. Trigger. This is so useful that you can, um, or actually, it's so useful and so long-winded that you can also just say trigger float float like that, 
and this is what you see more often. So here, what I want to do really is I want to take this number six and I want to put it in the pack and then I want to send 550 in the other inlet. This is, and now I've got the thing in a way that will work correctly. This is the same, this does the same thing as the, as the network that I had before, except that before I had the, this number box connected both to the 550 and to the zero, and you didn't know that they happened in the correct order, which is to put it in this inlet first and then put 550 here. Here? Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can say whatever you want. No problem. In fact, here it would be better style to say, give me a bang out this one. This is the, so this is the type of this outlet. And you don't need the floating point number because the message box will just convert it to the number 550 anyway. So it, and so here you would just send a bang out instead of a float, although I used float because I'd already introduced the possibility of float before. So this is the way to so this is the way to get something into an inlet and then make the object do something anyway. Whereas if you just want the if whereas if you just knew that this value was zero and want to control this object with, with or this number with a number box, it's the much easier situation to deal with, which is that you just take the number box in the pack. Oh wait, sorry, like this. <coughs> That's, so this is the easy case where you're changing this with the number box. This is the hard case where you're changing this with the number box. So sorry, this is much too much lore for one day. But lore is good. Or rather, lore isn't good in its own right, but knowing how to do this kind of stuff is good. And now I have to, now I have to clean this up for you and put it on the website so you can look at this in, in, your, in the fullness of time. Questions about this? Yeah. Oh, the uh, the trigger object always uh, puts its out, let's see, always sends messages to its outlets in right to left order. And, that, and it's right to left and not left to right because typically you want the leftmost thing to arrive last for the object afterward to work right. Yeah, that, I should have said that. <laughs> it was a very good question. Okay, now, now that I've done this, I can go back and remind you of the wonderful MIDI to frequency object. And now I have a sequencer that I can control using MIDI numbers. So let's, um, I'm running out of room here, but. I guess I'll just do as much as I can make room for. So let's see, we're going to have a seven note sequencer. <laughs> Yuck. Okay. Got five of them. All right. And now the only difference between these is that this one is going to go to cell zero, this to cell one, this to cell two, this to cell three, this to cell four. And let's just have a five note sequencer because I'm getting tired of this. No, five. And we'll go once per second and listen to it. Oops, yeah, so now what's a good melody that has five notes in it? Oops. Right? 
now we're making Western <coughs> tempered melodies in the table. So these numbers now, these numbers now are the frequencies in Hertz of the pitches which I specified in MIDI in these number boxes here. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, yes, okay. You could do that, but notice that I'm reading it. I would, I would need to use M to F tilde because the output of the table is in, as an audio signal. That would be another way to do it. M to, but of course, then you're doing the conversion every sample, which is more expensive computationally, whereas this is cheaper. Everyone's rested. <laughs> I, I can see why. There's a lot of very dry detail today, for which I apologize. Yeah, so next time we'll get back to samples and tables and reading, you know, storing sounds and tables and, and using oscillators to get them out.